My name is Dr. David Mesaros. I'm a legal manager and the co-founder of uh, Vicarium. Uh, Vicarium is a one-stop shop uh, service provider for corporate services for uh, legal and business solutions that are aimed at uh, blockchain uh, solutions, but also at uh, traditional uh, uh, corporate solutions and traditional corporate needs. So we're talking from uh, incorporation to setting up funds, managing them, asset protection, transactions, M&A, due diligence contracts, etc. boring stuff. Uh, whenever you hear uh, compliance, legal or regulatory, just uh, feel free to take a shot and then we can play that uh, kind of drinking game after the, the presentation. Uh, first, I would like to uh, try uh, to kind of uh, ease you into the legal environment of uh, cryptos, blockchain and just disruptive technologies all in all in general. Uh, the nature of legal evolution is such that it was always recreationary, uh, sorry, reactionary. Uh, there were in the beginning rulers, monarchs, despots uh, who eventually became the regulators and there was a public situation that need to, needed to be regulated and that was a reaction from the regulator to create a law or, or a testament or any kind of uh, contract, whatever you name it. Uh, and uh, basically this has continued for, for uh, centuries, for thousands of years up until the 20th century when the first uh, proactive movements began, when we had to anticipate the change before it actually happened. Uh, and why I start with this is because this is more important than ever before uh, in, in, in this uh, legal environment, in, in the blockchain era and in the, in the disruptive technologies era, AI uh, as well, because uh, law has become uh, dynamic. It used to be very static. If you just look at the CISG, it's uh, basically hundreds of years of uh, 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 case law and, and legal philosophy uh, has led up to the moment where the conventional and international sale of goods uh, was born. And then uh, now we have a, a, a pro forma model law for the international sale of goods. And that's a very good thing. But does that apply to digital assets, to digital goods, to uh, commercializable uh, uh, tokens or uh, security tokens uh, and yeah that's a good question that's a question for the future now where we are uh, at today and what we have is uh, basically three groups of, of regulators uh, there are the uh, negative ones the hostile jurisdictions, so to speak the neutral ones or indifferent ones or the ones in in uh, progress uh, and there is, of course, the friendly and, and, and the, the innovation-friendly jurisdiction group. <coughs> to just quickly summarize which one is which, uh, uh, basically on the, on the hostile end we have the obviously China and India and, and the colleagues already uh, mentioned them before. And uh, I would even say that the US belongs here, uh, not because of its attitude uh, towards crypto and blockchain, but because its attitude towards the need to be regulated. Uh, and and the sh should be and the need uh, be is, is, is a paradoxical situation because if you look at, for example, the statistics uh, published by PVC, then uh, most of the money raised and most of the money traded uh, uh, in cryptographic form still happens in the US, even though it's the heaviest uh, regulated jurisdiction uh, to date, except for the banned uh, uh, jurisdictions. <clears throat> then, of course, we have the, the neutral era. The, 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 the Luke uh, warm water, uh, that's basically the EU and uh, most of the uh, uh, European Union countries uh, with the exception of uh, some or with the exception of some European economic area countries. Uh, and uh, here it's not because they don't want to regulate it, uh, but they still live in the reactionary era, uh, but not with regards to the user, to the general populace but with regards to other regulators and to foreign uh, 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 and overseas uh, jurisdictions and what they're going to do so we do not make the same mistake, we just improve upon it. <coughs> and then basically uh, we come to the, the, the fundraising types, the crypto and, and the, the, the tokenization. Uh, and, oh sorry, I forgot to mention the, the friendly environment. That's just to give you a quick rundown. That's basically Switzerland, Gibraltar, um, Malta, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, it's, it's uh, far and few in between, but uh, what you should know about this is that they are uh, friendly in so far as they intend to welcome uh, crypto investors and they do not absolutely ban them. For example, the, the ink on the laws of uh, Malta that have been passed in May, the three bills uh, haven't even dried yet, so it cannot be really uh, considered actual law and actually well-founded and well-based uh, legal structure for cryptos. 
Uh, what is important to note here, uh, a difference, for example, if you take Switzerland as an incredibly uh, uh, innovation-friendly uh, uh, country uh, and contrast it uh, with the US, which is a very uh, stigmatized, strict, uh, strict and traditional uh, regulatory country, however, trying to be a, a pioneer, is that whatever is tokenized in the US is immediately considered a security. Uh, but how can we take that as as, as, as a pioneer movement or, or as, a, as, a, as a leading uh, di legal directive when there are the, the three main regulatory authorities within the same country, the CFTC and the IRS and the, the SEC that regulate the crypto transactions, and they have all differing uh, opinions about the very same thing. So how can we have one uh, globalized idea about cryptos and blockchain if within one country that's supposed to be the pioneer in regulation already have three differing ones? Uh, as opposed to that, uh, <coughs> in uh, Switzerland, we have a so-called uh, activity-based uh, approach, uh, whereas they don't look at whether you're doing crypto fundraising or traditional fundraising. They look at the activity for which it is used. Is it used for, uh, for utility purposes? And then the fable utility token uh, expression comes, or for security it's as, a, as an exchange or, or as a substitute for equity, or uh, is it used for some other purpose, like a tradable good or, or a commercial asset, etc. And then we have also uh, other jurisdictions like Malta or Gibraltar, where they uh, look at the case-by-case -case, uh, evaluation. Then. Uh, <clears throat> what is the difference between conventional and tokenized funds, for example, or legal vehicles that are designed around uh, either raising money or, or uh, exchanging it? Basically, uh, one of the biggest differences is the speed. If you are talking about a convertible note uh, or uh, uh, traditional LPs, uh, VCs, etc., then usually it's a slower process with more regulation in place. Uh, the assets are not so flexible, they're not so tradable. However, you can have a more guaranteed uh, return on your investment. As opposed to that, the tokenized version, it's fast, it's, 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 it's volatile. However, here of the volatility, I mean more from a legal perspective. I'll explain it in a second. And you can quickly cut your losses or you can quickly get rich. This is the pump and dump schemes and the quick uh, cash grabs that uh, the regulatory authorities uh, warn us about. <clears throat> now, about the volatility issues, and why that's very important when it comes to uh, fundraising mechanisms and, and funds and companies and uh, blockchain itself is the other colleagues, the other presenters have talked about the economic and the philosophic side of that and how it works in a practical way. However, uh, when we're talking about volatility, we also have to look at the volatility of the regulators because maybe something is positively regulated now or adversely regulated, but it can change in a moment, in, in, in just one uh, month. Uh, if you look at what happened in August, <coughs> apologies, sore throat, uh, with, the, with the ETF decision uh, by the SEC in the US, all of you who have Ethereum, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry for you. <laughs> and uh, because that big dump, that was a reactionary move uh, because of the regulatory decision. And it wasn't even a real decision, it was just a delay by 45 days, which has been revisited again, you saw again a dip. So all of this bearish market actually, from a legal point of view, comes from the regulators. And that kind of volatility uh, is present not just on an economic scale, but also where do you incorporate, what do you do, and uh, where do you pay your taxes? Taxes and licensing is very important. For, for conventional uh, uh, fundraising vehicles, you, you need uh, proper auditors, you need proper uh, uh, legal support, uh, you need licenses, you need proper incorporation, all that stuff, etc. We are all fa very familiar with that. However, for a tokenized uh, vehicle, you can basically just have a digital wallet and a website and you can start a fundraising. And uh, it has advantages, disadvantages. It's a very flexible method, it's very fast, it's very easy going, uh, but then there are the scams, there are the fakers, there are the, the uh, 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 pump and dump schemes, and there is virtually no uh, security safety for the investors whatsoever. What often happens, is that your uh, uh, position in, in the fund, in the company, is very vaguely uh, uh, described. Virtually for a token purchase agreement or a subscription agreement or an investment uh, uh, paper, memorandum, whatever, they use uh, any one of these uh, 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 denominations for investors who are actually investors. And uh, <coughs> the rights that you get in exchange for the tokens are 
lesser and lesser and lower and lower uh, uh, considering their legal, actual, enforceable value. When uh, a traditional uh, uh, VC, a traditional uh, uh, LP is in uh, trouble, when uh, there is a fundraising problem or legal issues, then you can make a legal complaint. But most of the time a token holder has almost no uh, uh, rights at all and cannot claim any kind of reparation. <clears throat> so be aware of that. Uh, and if you also look at the risk uh, section of these documents, sometimes they are 20 pages long and uh, basically they make you waive all of your rights, uh, class action arbitration, etc., to make it uh, as impossible as, possi uh, as possible for them uh, not to be sued. Uh, when we're talking about law and legal systems and the legal development of blockchain regulation, you cannot just say, oh yeah, it's happening. It's happening where? Which jurisdiction? Uh, and you cannot just take into account one jurisdiction. Sure, I have a shell company and BVI, so cool. Uh, you know, there are no uh, strict security laws. I don't have to pay taxes. I'm safe, right? Not really, because there's also the target audience, and that is most of the time uh, uh, causing a problem from either the US or uh, Chinese investors, etc. There are, of course, solutions. You go over to Hong Kong and you invest from there, etc or you create an offshore entity for a US investor, it's a foreign direct investment and then it's basically the offshore entity investing. I didn't say that, no offshoring here. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's very important also for the, for the data chain foundation where we incorporate because it has to be accessible by the investors, but it also has to be accessible by the public eye and by the regulatory authorities. What do I mean by that? There's always this uh, triangle when it comes to blockchain. There is how uh, one, one side of it is how the, the, the uh, promoters see themselves. Okay, we're doing everything uh, we can, we're doing the best of to our abilities, etc. There is other side where the investors see themselves. Okay, this is a good investment, I'm gonna make a short-term gain, long-term gain, etc. But there's the third one, and, and, and most people often forget about that, and that's the regulatory side. How does the regulator see me, and how will the regulator see me in the future? Uh, so. It's, it's, I would say this is the most crucial uh, question and the most crucial moment in, in setting up any kind of uh, uh, venture uh, when choosing uh, 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 to really uh, engage in blockchain activities is the jurisdiction. Then the elephant in the room, of course, it's the, it's the, it's the US. Can US investors uh, invest in a traditional uh, 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 legal vehicle uh, uh, that is onshore, offshore, but overseas? Yes, they can, but with uh, a, a lot of exemptions, a lot of regulations, licensing. Sure, all of you have heard about Reg A and Reg D, you know, the accredited investor exemption and institutional investor exemption because it's all the rage today and in every article they, they like to use this. It's good for search engine optimization. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, there are a lot of uh, uh, alternative methods to that. So if you have a US company or friends from the US who want to invest overseas, uh, you can do a, a foreign direct investment with the Reg S. You know, there are exemptions uh, as well. And just like I mentioned, you can also use a, a foreign entity in which you're a shareholder and then that entity invests uh, in, in whatever fund uh, you want it to be. Now the difference uh, here uh, between uh, blockchain-based or crypto-based uh, funds and, and, and legal vehicles and traditional ones is that as long as everything happens in a cryptographic form and it happens overseas or offshore, the SEC has no jurisdiction. The SEC has extended jurisdiction on investors personally. At the moment you withdraw it in fiat form and you have to pay taxes over it or you fail to fulfill that obligation. Future growth and uh, regulation in this area is, 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 a, is a hot topic. Uh, like I mentioned, the three main uh, regulators, the, the IRS and the SEC used to have different views on what a token or what a cryptocurrency is. Uh, for a long time, uh, the IRS considered it as an asset, because of course, taxes after assets, and the SEC considers it as a security. Now the CFTC uh, considers it as a commodity, uh, because it's, of course, the Commodities and <laughs> Futures Trading Commission. Why wouldn't they? Uh, so that they can draw it under their jurisdiction, under their scope of activities. Now lately we have seen a, a bit of a collaboration between these uh, authorities. Uh, over the course of the summer, the IRS and the SEC agreed that these are securities. So they now work hand in hand, hooray. And uh, going offshore, just to really quick, because I already mentioned this, uh, basically 
whether you're talking about traditional fundraising or this new uh, 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 crypto way, going offshore is always almost the best way just to put extra layers between yourself and the regulators. The only hardship that, and, and that's also really good for personal asset management and personal estates if you want to set this up because your uh, proceeds from crypto dealings uh, can go to this one and then you can basically uh, uh, store them safely until the storm uh, blows away, until the regulatory authorities decide on a way to go, especially here in the European Union. One thing to be uh, aware of or, or afraid of is that uh, offshore companies uh, need a lot of deposits and a lot and, and, and meticulous uh, paperwork to create onshore bank accounts, especially even Swiss, Swiss uh, bank accounts. Uh, humble beginnings. Uh, what do I mean by that? There are some companies that just create an LLC type of company, a limited liability uh, form. However, they uh, call it a special purpose vehicle. Within that special purpose vehicle, they are basically raising fund, but up to a certain limit. This certain limit uh, changes based on the jurisdiction in, the, in Europe. It's uh, usually below 150, so that we stay below the prospectus and the public solicitation directives. And in the uh, US, it's usually 99, so they uh, can still say that these are just private investors and it's a private sale. Uh, basically, they're just trying to avoid uh, the public uh, licensing and public regulations. Then uh, when you're becoming really, really big and you're, you're reaching your true potential and you're becoming a global uh, entity uh, as, a, as a either a traditional or crypto-based uh, fund or company, you might consider actually applying for licenses. Uh, this happens at around 2,000 individual investors uh, <coughs> and or at $100 million uh, uh, raised because these are the special exemptions uh, set by the by the US uh, uh, regulatory authorities. The uh, other thing that you might consider when becoming big uh, is that in the US there is a so-called one year uh, lockup period or vesting period uh, that is currently uh, exists in traditional uh, uh, fundraising methods, but non-existent for, for uh, crypto and crypto based uh, trading or uh, hedge funds or, or any kind of legal vehicles. And that kind of allows for a ready a really quick uh, return on your investment, uh, no matter how big the uh, organization is. And then uh, that would be all. I don't want to take any much of your time. If you have any uh, questions, either now or while having drinks, I'm uh, more than happy to answer them. Yes. <coughs> I, I, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, the first one about this, which you, about uh, <coughs> the AI uh, stuff. Yes, yeah, so AI stuff and who is uh, responsible for from that case. And second is particular about what you said about uh, one year uh, lockup. Yes. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, crypto hedge funds uh, now appearing. And do if for example if they invest in some kind of security tokens, do they uh, this up, uh, applies or not? The, uh, which because one do I answer first? Do I talk about first the AI or do you want to hear first about the security? I'll, I'll go in order. Okay. So about the, the AI question and the uh, making the AI responsible, uh, a couple of years ago there have been a series of uh, uh, proceedings in front of the European Court of Justice. Uh, cannot recall the exact uh, number of the cases, I'm sorry. Uh, this happened in the Baltic region uh, with hotels. And what they were doing is they purchased a, a, a program, an algorithm, a series of codes, uh, which were uh, price matching with each other, which is against competition rules uh, because it uh, creates cartels and price fixing. Uh, however, they claimed that they purchased the programs, the AI, uh, in good faith so that they can fire that department and then the AI can do uh, that work, obviously. However, what happened is that the AI communicated between all of the hotel chains in that region uh, that had the same code and it set fixed the price at the same level in all hotels and in all, uh, uh, basically the same hotels for the same price. And uh, there has been a study on it and that's also another important uh, point about current and disruptive technology that there are very few peer-reviewed articles and peer-reviewed studies about the actual technology and the legal complications uh, because it's just so new. But the study about this, the legal study by the European Court of Justice and the uh, extra opinion of the uh, 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 Advocate General found that they should have uh, 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 
taken the liability of the algorithm uh, and uh, questioned that. However, regulation at that time was not so advanced uh, as to give uh, legal rights and obligations to basically a series of codes. So in the end, they uh, uh, created a shared uh, liability between the purchasers, so the hotel uh, operators, and the creator uh, of the code. <coughs> oh, and um, about the securities uh, question uh, and the lockup period. In the US, since uh, it's a de facto decision that uh, uh, they just consider all token securities, there is decided. It's one year lockup, no matter what, it's for tokens. Officially, I mean, uh, you can go around it, but officially speaking. In Europe, most of these lockup and vesting periods are arbitrary. They come up with a number, uh, usually it's solicitation-wise, and to create a, a stable price for the token, they come up with a 45 to X days, however patient their investors are. Now, um, currently, tokens themselves do not, in most cases and in most countries, do not fall under uh, uh, securities regulations. For example, in the Netherlands, uh, where I operate uh, predominantly, uh, the AFM, the Local Authority for Financial Markets, uh, issued a legal opinion to me personally because I asked for it, and they said that ICOs, uh, OTC exchanges and Bitcoin trading itself does not fall under the scope and the regulation uh, of, of the financial markets. And uh, usually whatever the Benelux does, uh, the Belgium and, 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 and the Dutch uh, regulators, uh, is reflected on the uh, ESMA, the European uh, Authority for, for Financial Markets, and uh, currently that's the situation in the EU. Yes? The IRS and the, the CFTC. And all those guys. I think there's another person that's quite, quite powerful. The, the FinCEN, you mean? The FBI. Oh, the FBI. Yeah, actually. Because if you're, if you're doing anything in dollars, they can just come and knock you away. Very you true, are. very true. And so. However, then we are talking. If you're doing, or, if you're, if you're doing a token sale in dollars, I mean, you're French or you're Australian. But then we're talking on the criminal side. Yeah, but still. It's very easy to break over to that side from the, from the civil. Uh, that's agree with you 100%. And it's a, it's it's a it's a foe to be reckoned with. It's a very powerful organization. But also in in combination with that is FinCEN. Uh, 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 also for the for the money uh, transmitter licensing. If you want to open an exchange uh, on yeah, the U.S. soil. That's more regulated thing. Yes. But the FBI can come knocking for nothing. I actually have a personal experience with the with the FBI. Uh, I was an advisor for, for a US-based ICO and it turned out to be a scam through and through. And uh, uh, to this day, the, both the FBI and the SEC have active pending investigations against the, or, or the founder of that uh, stuff. So it's, it's scary. <laughs> it's yeah. scary, very scary. Absolutely. Yes? Yeah, so just for, I have two points uh, for you and one for here that we, some of us here in the room will know the crackdown on foreign gambling in the US. They sent out black helicopters wherever they found US people gambling. Even if they were, you know, like anonymously or whatever, they sent out black helicopters. I completely agree. Now, I saw you agree on the issue of Ethereum pricing, but I have to tell you that I thought about Ethereum pricing for 20 <laughs> seconds and I came up with a better explanation. Please share. The bloody hardware for Ethereum that's been mining, I don't give it like not even one chance in a million that the, the Chinese people who are mining Ethereum, I don't give it one chance in a million that they are saving more than 10% of the Ethereum. They're probably cashing out into Bitcoin quickly and maybe even in, into dollars quickly. Uh, so a lot of Ethereum is coming from that side of, of, the, of the pond. And uh, it has to be a big factor. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not claiming that it's the only factor, what I said, but uh, it, was a, it was a one on one reaction. So it's, I think it was 8th of August uh, when they delayed the decision, and the next day you could see uh, the, the prices drop and we have the, the yes, bear. Yes, but when I do my trading and I say things like what you're telling me now to other people, they tell me, oh, you're an idiot. You think you know why the market moved? Shut up and just, you know, try to. Pre uh, to understand it, not to predict it or whatever. Of course. Um, the the thing which confused me a little bit in your presentation, and I don't know if you did it intentionally so that we will need your services, 
I say yes. I don't know what, but I say yes. A couple of the parts were like from the point of view of the guy uh, kind of creating the SEO. Uh, and then I, f I felt that a couple of the parts were about the guy who would be investing in the ICO. Now, I didn't have proper, uh, proper time. I'm brand new in this uh, location. So I didn't have proper time to understand who is selling what to whom because we we all started with a kind of a apology that we're not selling or explanation that yes. we don't sell anything to anybody. Although I we, am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you did have parts where the point of view was the part of the investor, and you did Absolutely. have parts where the point of view was of the ICO of the mission. promoter. Yeah, uh, yes. The promoter, right. So, uh, but there's also the part of the regulator, and that's, uh, that's I, basically the, the uh, triangle. Yeah, so I, I did feel that, uh, at least for like the first the presentation, uh, uh, you did uh, miss, uh, lose me somewhere, like you confused me a little mm -hmm. bit, but probably it was all part of your Floyd. Well, so, so. let's say it like that. <laughs> all right, just making sure that... Of uh, course, of course. But we will have also ample time to, to discuss anything to in, 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 even, in, to even further, <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> know. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then uh, thank you for having me.